Well, welcome home, church. What a joy it is that we can come together, worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and just be showered with his love and grace this morning. We get to be blessed with that today as we continue our series of talking about God's grace. And today, specifically, asking the question, is the grace for me? Sometimes you and I, sometimes many of us have a struggle of receiving God's grace and living in the joy and the peace that that brings. We'll talk more about that during the message today. We do have just a few announcements as we begin. This last week, we also had Feed My Starving Children here. In over three days, we had 620 volunteers physically pack meals for kids throughout the world that need desperately food just for their survival. The amazing thing is we met our goal of $60,000 raised for this project as well. And also with all of the meals packed, we packed 248,832 meals, including with the fundraising goal that we had. That feeds 681 kids for a year. What an amazing effort that is. Praise God for that. So thank you for your continued support of this important ministry as we go forward. Also, we want to make sure that you're aware of our Love 217 Serve Day coming up on Sunday, October 23rd. We're going to take our worship into the community just as we did once last year. And on Sunday, the 23rd, we're going to have one service, 9 a.m., right here in the sanctuary. We'll gather for 30 minutes for prayer and praise. Then we're going to head out into the community and serve at all kinds of different locations, blessing this community as a church here at St. Paul's. So we encourage you to join us because we'll be serving in the community from like 9.30 to around noon. Then we're going to come back here, join in the, in the um, dining room. I couldn't think of the term for a minute there. The dining room. We're going to join there for lunch, talk about the stories of serving as well, and just share some fellowship time together. As you exit today, the tables that you see right outside the center, uh, Uh, doors there are where you can actually register and sign up for where you'd like to serve that morning. We would like to have well over 300 individuals join us to serve in the community as we really try to launch this project of Loving 217 and this movement that we're trying to create. Also to that end, you've seen some of the leadership pastors, um, all other people wearing these Love 217 t-shirts. And what we would like you to do is if you'd like to, you can purchase one of those shirts. It's also at a table in the back. You can go there. It's $10 or more for a shirt. If you pay $10, great. If you can bless with more to bless this ministry as we begin this movement to love our community and love 217, we'd love you to buy a t-shirt and join us in that. What a great thing that we have so much going on right here in this community, right here at this church that God continues to bless us with. So as we begin worship today, why don't we stand and just greet each other in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
We make a beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that you've brought us here on this glorious morning that you have blessed us with. And Lord, as we continue to worship you, Lord, we pray that you would work in us in just a mighty way through your Spirit. Continue to bless us with your gifts today and evermore. We pray this in Jesus' glorious name. <coughs> Amen. As we come together, the, the first thing we have the blessing to do is to come before our God and one another and confess our sins. So please join me in confessing our sins. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved you in the as says ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your way, that we walk in your glories, to the glory of your holy name. As we call an ordained servant of the word of God and in the stead of our Christ, our Savior, I announce to you the forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our scripture readings. Our first lesson is a reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 14 through 21. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is a reading from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Out of respect for Jesus and his words of life, we stand for the reading of the gospel. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because of their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be, should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heaven and earth will never pass away. Sorry. <laughs> Why don't we join together in confessing our common faith by the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. house for dinner and I gave you a glass of water that had this much water in it and a tiny bit of food. How would you like that? You probably wouldn't like it very much. <laughs> well, the truth is if you come over to my house for dinner, it's more than likely that I'll lavishly dish out the food and the drink for you. I love hosting people, so I would want to make sure that your plate was overflowing and there was more than enough. The Bible tells us that God does the same thing with grace. God isn't stingy with grace. 
He doesn't just give us a little bit of grace to certain people. God offers heaps and heaps of grace to everyone. God lavished his grace upon us. He gives us more than enough grace and it can overflow in our lives and it can be shared with other people. God's grace is for you and there's plenty of it to go around. See ya. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, after that reading, it's a good thing we're talking about grace today. You know, it's amazing because grace is something that is so tremendous. You've probably heard it a thousand times or maybe even more, that God's grace, his favor, his longstanding kindness to us, his goodwill towards us is simple enough and it's all that we need. The believing in the grace that God has given to us, shown through Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, that that's all you need to carry you through this life and all the way into eternity. Far from the demands that we hear in the world of living a perfect life and free from sin. His grace is enough. It paid the debt that you and I owe for all of our wrong choices, our decisions, our actions. It's finished. And we hear all of that, but so many times we add to it the word but. We know truly that it truly is God's grace is the undeserved favor of God. As we heard last week, as Pastor Mark actually shared that with us, but we get to this place and we wonder truly, is God's grace truly free? Many of us try to insert that word but in there, whether we read it in scripture and hear, hear God's word say that God's grace is for us and God's grace is free, we tend to add but, not for me. We hear a sermon or a message that talks of God's grace, and still we, we hear it, but yet we still add the word but. We hear a devotional that speaks of God's grace, and we say, that is tremendous, but I don't know. It shows up in the way that we live our lives and how we speak and how we pray, of the ridiculous demands that we place on our lives and on ourselves and on the people around us. The but that we keep inserting there is something that, that we keep adding in. It's something that we add to the gospel message that truly God's grace is free and it takes away the true blessing of the gospel. This most amazing news that God's grace has been showered on us because of what Jesus has done. And yes, we believe in the gospel, but... We wonder, is grace truly for me? I say this because I actually have had trouble receiving God's grace at times. Even this last week, I had trouble receiving God's grace. You see, yesterday was supposed to be um, senior night at the football game at LSA, and my daughter's a senior. And if you've noticed, I'm the only one here this weekend. Pastor Bill and Pastor Mark are off at the, at the camp out that's taking place this weekend as well. And my daughter came to me and said, you know, Dad, I want you to be at that game because it's senior night and you're supposed to be there with me and walk on the field with me. And I said, yeah, but I've got service on Saturday night. The game starts at 6 and the service is, is at 6. And, and I wanted some grace from her, but I knew I wasn't going to get it. And I wanted some grace in the church, but I felt like I couldn't ask for it. 
And I went to our worship planning meeting, and I went up to Allie, and I said, Allie, we're going to have to change the service Saturday night. Can we move the message forward, or, or can we do something so I can get out of there and make it to the game? But I felt terrible asking for that, thinking that here I was letting the people down that were here for Saturday night, that they weren't going to get the full service that I felt they deserved. And so we came up with a plan that we were going to record the message, and that way then I could actually not even be there at all Saturday night. We had a, another pastor that was going to be here in my place that was going to handle Saturday night and therefore then that was going to be done but then I felt bad asking the pastor to come and feeling like I wasn't living up to my duties as your senior pastor and taking that role that I need to be and I was struggling with how do I do this pleasing my daughter and my wife but yet pleasing the church as well and I wasn't sure what to do so we recorded the message on Thursday and I was all ready to go and then Thursday afternoon I got the call that senior night was moved. They moved it to actually when homecoming is going to be later in the month, and I was actually pretty ticked off. <laughs> I didn't really show much grace because here I had done everything scrambling all week. I had made my, sure my message was done really early. I had spent time recording the message and making sure that was done. I had talked to the whole staff and had them jumping through hoops so that we could make this work, and suddenly now it was at no use. And so I called the other pastor and I said, hey, look, you don't need to be here any longer. I'll be at the service and we'll be okay. See, sometimes we have trouble receiving grace. A lot of times it's because I believe we just don't give self-compassion to ourselves and we're not willing to give grace to ourselves when we actually need it. Perhaps it's one reason that we struggle so deeply to understand this idea of God's grace given so freely to us. It's because we aren't really comfortable receiving, are we? Many of us don't like to receive at all. And because we don't like to receive, the idea of receiving God's grace freely and believing that it's for me is very difficult for all of us. Because everything that we see in this world is geared around somehow gaining value, always earning, always doing something in order to receive something else. For us, we know that truly God's grace is not contingent on anything, but yet we still tend to add that but. See, here's the problem, is that if we can't receive and accept grace, then in a lot of ways, we will never fully be able to give it to others. And that grace that God gives to us is grace that is meant to be received but then to pay passed on. You know, I can't help but think of a story of my mom and dad. And by the way, this is not my mom and dad, okay? <laughs> Um, but the story is one of, of a person who could not receive grace. My dad, when, when they were married around 53 years, and my dad's been gone for about 22 years, but when, when they were married for around 53 years, my dad was not the best homemaker. He grew up in an era where doing dishes and things like that was something he didn't do. <clears throat> But one night he decided to bless my mom by actually going and doing the dishes. And so he got up and he went and he started washing all the dishes. And one by one he washed the dishes and it was great that he did that. And he got done with doing all of the dishes and all of the pans, which was really unusual for him to do that. But he, he finished and he reached over and he turned on the garbage disposal. And as we always do, you know, you watch all of the suds and everything go down and and he saw that there was one glass that was still sitting there on the counter with some liquid in it. So he grabbed it and he threw it in the sink and started washing the glass and he heard this terrible grinding sound. So he quickly shut off the garbage disposal and started digging inside trying to figure out what it was and he pulled out my mom's wedding ring, her engagement ring and all of her jewelry that she had sitting in a glass cleaning. Now he felt horrible. 
He took the garbage disposal off and out, and he was dumping it out, trying to find the diamonds that was in there, trying to find anything that he could just to try to make something better from what it was. And my mom was, yes, sad, but I remember my mom looking at him and saying, you know, Bob, I love you. It's okay. I forgive you. But my father could not receive that. He had so much trouble receiving the grace that my mom was giving him. My mom showered him with grace on this moment. I remember all of the time that my mom would say, it's okay, it's okay. Giving him grace, but yet he could not forget about that moment that he destroyed all those rings. He even tried to earn the grace again as he went out and he bought even a bigger ring and a nicer ring and he gave it to her and she was so pleased to have it but she said, it's okay, you don't need to do that. But yet at the same time, he still, even after trying to earn it, he could not receive the grace. And to the day that he died, he could not forgive himself or receive the grace from my mom for what he had done that day. Now this is not a story, men, that you don't do dishes, okay? This is a story of receiving grace because ultimately we all know the gift of salvation. We know that that Jesus says the same thing just like my, my mother said to my father. He says, I love you and I'm excited to give you this great gift of grace and I forgive you. He describes himself as the bridegroom and offers each one of us the priceless jewel of salvation, which leads us to this unbelievable life with God, one that is a close relationship with him, forgiven of everything that we've ever done wrong, one that is truly given of grace, undeserved favor of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And yes, as we heard from last week, for by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not from yourselves It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. See, none of us deserves Jesus' precious gift of salvation and the grace that he gives to us. None of us can live a perfect life without mistakes and errors. No matter how hard we try on our own, we've all done bad things. We've carried out awful motives, and we actually have harmed others. Because we know, as it says in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that word is highlighted because it means each and every one of us. See, many times we struggle with this idea of knowing that we fall short and we don't live up to standards that we actually sin in our lives. I struggled with this early in my ministry as when I was at church, I felt like I wasn't doing things as perfectly as I could or living up to the role as a pastor like I should. And I never felt comfortable there. And when I went home, I felt like I was letting my family down and I wasn't the father or the husband that I should be there. And it seemed like when I was at church, I was guilty because I wasn't at home. And when I was home, I felt like I was guilty because I wasn't at church. And it was a constant struggle for me, trying to understand that even though I am called to live this life, that it's not called to be lived perfectly because I cannot do it and none of us can. We all live sinful lives. We all do things that are bad, that are unlovable at times, but still God showers us with his grace. And because that grace comes to us, what I learned is that I need to give myself compassion and grace as well. I mean, how many of us sitting here this morning, struggle with showering ourselves with grace and self-compassion. Many of us do. And what I forgot were these following verses. The fo- for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for the, a righteous person, though perhaps a good person one would dare to even die. But God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
See, even though we are sinners, even though we make mistakes, even though we can't live perfect lives, Jesus still died for us, gave us his love and grace when we didn't deserve it. He gave us that love and grace even though he knew we could never earn it. He gave us that love and grace and died for us while we were still sinners. And that should bring glory to us, knowing that, yes, I'm going to continue to make mistakes. I will continue to live a life that's not perfect. But because of Jesus, I know his grace is there for me. Can we say amen? Amen. And what we need to do is this idea called integration. This idea of one has the ability to express loss or failure or weakness or mediocrity limits negative impulses and sin and yet maintain a loved self that shame and guilt are not internalized or overwhelming that we truly know yes we are sinners but in christ we are now something different in christ living in us we are not defined by our sinfulness in christ we don't have to feel shame we don't have to feel guilt we don't have to let all of that internalize in us and overwhelm us that we can live in the idea that we are both saint and sinner at the same time that yes we have bad things in us we do bad things but at the same time we also have good in us that comes from christ alone and his spirit in us it's the ability to metabolize the negative aspects of our life the losses the imperfections the sin and the pain and to truly understand that we can give ourselves self-compassion that we can still love ourselves because of christ living in us that we are able to receive God's grace and to believe and truly know that it is when we were unworthy that God died for us. That we no longer have to push away God's grace. That we no longer have to say, you know what, I'm going to add that but there because I know God's grace is free, but it's just not for me. We don't have to deny the power of Christ. We don't have to turn our back on his strength. We don't have to say that grace is not enough and therefore I'm going to work harder to make sure that it's sufficient for me. We don't have to live without rest, without joy, and without peace in our lives, weary and done We can live in God's grace, truly knowing that God's grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. That truly Jesus came to set us free from the bondage of our sin. He came to set us free so that we could receive his grace. He came to make sure that we know that we are forgiven so that we can receive his grace and live in that more and more each and every day. And to know that we actually are a new creation. Listen to these words. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting uh, to us the message of reconciliation. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a tremendous passage that is, and one that I think we need to hear more often, that we are a new creation in Christ, that the old has truly been gone and washed away and passed away. We no longer have to worry about that old self, that sinful self that is in us, that you can sit here today knowing that you have been regenerated into a new creation. One that is not not defined by our sinfulness, but defined by the righteousness, the love, and the grace of Jesus Christ. That is who you are. That is who I am. And we should be joyous in that and say, praise God, amen. A new creation that we are 
no longer burdened by contemplating on our sinfulness. Yes, we are aware of that because we know the need of our Savior. But living today in the joy of knowing we are a new creation, one that has been showered with God's grace, a new creation where the old has passed away and the new is alive in Christ in us. Today, May this message be one that allows you to receive God's love and grace in a much deeper way than ever before. May we live here with a strong self-love for us, knowing that truly Christ loved us enough to die for us. May we truly know that God's grace is for each one of us and for every person in this world. And may we shower that grace on ourselves, on our family and all those who come in our path today. It is in Jesus' name and to his glory we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to continue with our offering. And as we do so, we're going to pass the baskets through the aisle as we've, as we've started doing once again. This is a time for us to say thank you to God for all that he has done for us and all that he has given to us and as a way for us to share back to him a portion of how generous he has been to us. Also, as we continue with this, you can fill out the Connect cards that are there in the pew. You can leave those in the boxes that are by the doors as you exit today. Oh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. And Lord, we just thank you for this, this reminder of your love and grace that is showered upon us. That Lord, even though we were sinners, you still loved us in such a, an amazing way. That you were willing to die for us so we could have forgiveness. That you rose again so that we could have new life. And Lord, that changes everything for us. So, Lord, as we, as we gather this morning, we, we lift up to you those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who are in need of forgiveness and love, Lord. And so we lift up to you today, Lincoln Canada, Cindy Ryan, Pastor Gary Tricky, Rod Lorenz, Donna Spinner, Bob Collins, 
Michelle Carmichael, Rebecca, Pam Moreau, Timothy Jenks, Tanya Goldenstein Jacobson, Reese Hall and Lori Eddings, Jerry Winberg, Richard Snyder, and Tom Wilson. Lord, we pray that you would endow the doctors and nurses, Lord, with all the knowledge and skills, Lord, they need, Lord, to provide healing and comfort and peace at this time. The Lord, you would raise up individuals from this family of believers here, this family that we share, to go and just spend a moment of time with these individuals, letting them know, Lord, that they are truly not forgotten, that they are truly loved and a part of this family. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to do an amazing work through us here as your family of faith. Let us be sort of vessels of your love and grace in this community, connecting others and inviting them into a relationship with Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would just do an amazing revival right here in this place. That, Lord, we know that Jesus is what is needed to change this community and this world. And so, Lord, we pray that you would use us in a mighty way so that truly, Lord, we could make a difference in this community. But more than anything, that you would work through us to share your love and grace and the message of Jesus Christ so more would truly come and find a grace-filled life right here. We pray for hostilities to cease throughout this whole world, but especially what we see happening in Ukraine. That, Lord, we pray that that you would let all conflicts stop and that, Lord, peace would be something that would descend on, on all this entire world, but also, Lord, upon this community as well. We pray, Lord, that you would just continue to guide our steps and give us wisdom as we follow you on this mission that you have given to your church. We pray, Lord, that you would just bless us in ways beyond anything we could ever imagine and that your generosity would just flow through all of us, Lord, towards this community and this church as we continue to support the ministry that we share here at St. Paul's. Lord, we pray for those attending the annual Dads, Grandpas, and Kids camp out at Camp Silka this weekend. We pray that their time together with family and friends would one, be one that would truly build them together, draw them closer, but also closer, closer to you, Jesus. And we pray that you would keep them safe, but also have safe travels home as well. So, Lord, all of these prayers we lift to you, saying, Lord, thank you for letting us pray, but, Lord, thank you more than anything for hearing these prayers and acting upon them. And so, Lord, as we conclude our time of prayer, we do so with the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the great ways of grace that we get to celebrate is coming to the Lord's table, where he showers upon us his love and grace once again through his body and blood. As we are reminded once again of the fact that we truly have forgiveness in Christ and we have eternal life with him as well. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. He gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is New Testament in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Well, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace, knowing that your sins are forgiven. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn. We receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.